Hi, we're Ralph and Lonnie, and we're here with July 2018's forecast, which I am lucky enough to read this time. Let's put on the little peepers and see how well I do. <laughs> Events relax their pace as Mercury in Leo slows, getting ready to turn retrograde on the 25th. Didn't we just have a retrograde? Mm. Must be my imagination. Use the white circle day on the 3rd to push projects forward. On the 9th, Venus enters practical Virgo, making people a little more restrained about their relationships, less idealistic and more comfortable. On the 10th, Jupiter turns direct, so expect a surge in commodities and agriculture. On the 12th, that black box day is due to the solar eclipse mm. in Cancer, opposing Pluto. There are hidden global issues at work. From the 12th until the second eclipse on the 27th is emotionally complex time, so adjust, process, and be okay with hiding out. When you're feeling bound up or stressed out during this time, just remember everyone is being affected by this between the eclipses event, so cut them and yourself some slack. The Venus trine Saturn on the 13th is a good time to be close to your parents or reinforce that love connection. The white circle day on the 22nd, when the sun enters his ruling sign Leo, makes it easy to be charming, optimistic, move projects along. Focus on being heart-driven, which makes up for Mercury turning retrograde on the 25th. Well, maybe it doesn't make up for it, but okay, it's a little bit better. Which earns a black box day, as the day is not one to be overly ambitious. The lunar eclipse on the 27th sets off a grand cross in fixed signs that includes Mars, Uranus, and by a wide aspect, Jupiter. Be careful around this time. The stars are less forgiving of aggressiveness and over-enthusiasm than usual. Freak accidents, emotional outbursts that turn physical could arise. This is the second eclipse series of the year. It occurs in the sign of Leo, as did the one in 2017, which marched across the continental United States. Summer eclipses tend to be intense because we're outside more, more connected to the natural world and emotionally open. Mm. That's a good observation. You know, the time of year that these events happen really color them, even if they're similar to other events that have happened at other times. I mean, in our work as uh, naturopathic doctors, we often talk about the fact that, you know, certain conditions get exaggerated either in the winter months or the summer months, depending mm -hmm. on how much of your skin is covered up, how much sun time you get, and all of those things. So remember, the astrological weather, you know, affects your health too. It's like the fact that there's a lot of less incidence of certain diseases below certain latitudes because the people there get simply a lot more sunshine and thus vitamin D and other benefits that come from being in the sun more often. I like how the month of July starts off kind of laid back, no real aspects on the Thankfully. first and on the second, you know, and then you've got that white circle day on the third. Yes. It's just a sun trine moon, but there isn't anything that's a detrimental aspect, and the moon is playing nice with everybody. Right. And that sun trine moon, you know, that's a big time for projects to move forward because you have a basic harmony going on, and it's after the full moon, so you have all this energy that's built up, and when it gets to the sun trine moon after the full moon, it's when it goes whoosh. Well, and think about it. The trine is the most stable shape mm. in geometry, mm. uh, and the trine between the sun and the moon is really a, a trine, a stability between your character, your sense of identity and purpose, and your emotional motivation and, and drive to do something. So when those things are, when those, just those two elements are trine, it really helps you to know that the projects that you want to get forward are kind of balanced, stable, and you're doing the right thing. Right, and it is kind of nice that that's happening the day before July 4th, you know, our national holiday. Uh, we had lived in Philadelphia for many, many years, some of us longer than others, and Philadelphia takes July 4th very seriously. It is our holiday. After and all. isn't it perfect that the moon is void, of course, the whole day long, yes. meaning you're not going to be able to focus on anything, get too much done. It's a holiday. Who yes. cares? You don't have to worry about it. You know, you may have to pay a little more attention if you're driving to a place, right. you know, or something like that. But, you know, for the most part, that's the best kind of void of course day you're yes. ever going to have. It's about reflection. It's about family. It's about friends. It's about making the chicken salad. It's about... 
getting the picnic stuff together. <laughs> it's a, a great day for that. So happy July 4th to all those who are watching this in July. Now, you're right. It, it's nice that it starts off easy. And it's interesting that on the 9th, you know, on the 10th, you have two different uh, things going on. You have Venus entering Virgo. Venus in Virgo is not a strong position. In fact, it's actually considered a very weak position for Virgo because Venus is all about connectedness and maybe indulgence. And Virgo is about defining and separation and control. So you can see it's not... And constructive criticism, and which constructive criticism. Venus doesn't care for very much. Constructive criticism. It's not really that thing. But it has certain... It does have certain benefits at the same time. Um, it will I come like to the me fact that it kind of reigns in Venus That's a little true. bit. Because left on her own, Venus can really be very self-indulgent. She yeah. can overeat. She can spend too much money. Uh, she can be a bit lazy, you know, those are all things that are counteracted by the fact that Virgo uh, reigns that in for her. And there is a nice little undercurrent that's going on there, because in those days, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, Venus is actually passing over a fixed star called Regulus. And you're having two different things going on, because on the 4th, 5th, right around there, uh, the sun is passing right over Sp uh, Sirius, who is kind of the patron star of the United States. The United States was purposely founded uh, to line, have the sun line up with Sirius, which was the royal star of Egypt. It's, a very, it's the brightest star in the sky. And so during that time of year, we'd normally have this great, wonderful feeling of being protected as the sun goes over Sirius. And then right after that, Venus, who everyone loves, everyone, yes, mm -hmm. is passing right over Regulus, the heart of the lion. So even though it's going into Virgo, it's passing over Regulus, this very beneficial, loving, big, grand energy. So you will feel this wonderful you know, fullness of feeling at that time, even though it is going into Virgo. Well, so maybe Virgo will just moderate that to the extent that it'll be focused on a little bit more practical and not a little as much fluffy uh, exactly. issues. Exactly. And then the very next day, the 10th, right. Jupiter in, has been retrograde in Scorpio yes. and finally goes direct. Now, Jupiter retrograde in Scorpio, that's a little intense. Yeah. You know, looking inward for your optimism, yeah. your, you know, uh, but hopefully you've found ways to be generous to yourself, you know. Right. Uh, but uh, going direct is really going to make you feel like you're making progress because with that Jupiter in Scorpio retrograde, sort of issues of the past really become larger than they should really be in your current life. Yeah, and, and Jupiter in Scorpio is not an easy position in the first place. And if you actually kind of look at the a, a big part of this year, there's been a lot of intensity going on because that's what Scorpio does and Jupiter makes that bigger. What's interesting is that when Jupiter goes direct, Jupiter has a lot to do with the markets, has a lot to do with real estate. So that's why we say commodities, real estate, things like that will tend to see a surge. And any place where you work in cooperation with other people, managing resources will tend to move along more easily at that point. But then we come to the eclipses. And this is, this is really the elephant in the room. The, the time of the two eclipses from the 12th to the 27th. Uh, uh, what do you say about an eclipse? It's, it's an intense time. And the period of time between the two, from the 12th to the 27th, is emotionally complex. It's like that movie, it's complicated. You know? <laughs> it, just, it complicates everything because everyone feels things more emotionally. And this is happening in the sign of cancer, which is the definition of emotional complication. Right. So, of course, it starts out with the new moon, you know, is, uh, and goes to the full moon. The new moon being defined as the sun and moon both being mm. in Cancer. So that eclipse really has to hit home very mm. hard, you know, because it's all Cancer, the mother, the home life, the hearth, that ki those kinds of issues. And then when you get to, it sort of builds, that insight kind of builds until you get to the full moon, which brings everything to full light. Mm. And of course, the full moon is defined by the sun and moon being an opposite sign. So if the sun is in at that time, it has moved on to Leo, mm. then the moon is going to be in, in Aquarius. Aquarius. Um, so no, during that period of time, chill, take it easy. Cut, like we said in the forecast, cut people some extra slack. Don't 
don't pressure yourself too much. It's funny, in, in India during the big eclipses, um, they'll actually recommend to uh, pregnant women to get in the tub and stay in the tub during the eclipse to protect themselves from the, the influences. I'm not sure I buy that, but... <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 eclipses are, 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 have never been viewed as, um, as a positive influence. Well, but you know, I have to say that I encounter a lot of full mooners, people mm. who are born with a full moon dynamic in their natal chart. Uh, probably the biggest reason that I encounter all these people with the full moon is I'm born in a partile full moon. So yes. my sun and moon are both at 20 degrees. So I'm, I'm exact on the uh, full moon. And I wasn't born during an eclipse, but that full moon energy is one that I really appreciate. And so many of the people that I know who have or come across that have this full moon energy in their chart, they just have a different way of seeing sort of both sides of the issue. Of course, they have an internal struggle about do I, in, you know, in, in my case, my full moon is in um, is Scorpio Taurus, you know. Mm. So it's like, do I indulge myself or deny myself? So you've always got that polarity going on. But I think you're kind of comfortable with that and you're comfortable with uh, looking at the other side. So mm. even if you don't have a full moon in your natal chart, yeah. it's kind of a nice way to approach the eclipse or the full moon every time the full moon comes around, just as an opportunity to kind of see something that you don't normally see, see something that's an opposite point of view from a different light. Well, you know, it's funny that the uh, people born at the full moon eclipse tend to be intense. You might say they tend to really embody that, but I'm not going to go into that in details. By the way, Mount Mercury, the other thing that's included is the fact that Mercury is going retrograde. Um, and it's Mercury in Leo is going to go retrograde on the 25th. It takes all the way to the 18th of August for it to go direct. So during that period of time, take the time to go back and take care of things you didn't do before. You know, refine things, deal with the details. That's an important thing that you say because people say, oh, Mercury retrograde, I can't do anything, I can't start anything, I can't send emails, I can't do a mailing, I can't call people, I can, you know, misunderstandings, all these glitches and problems with communications. Um, but you know what? You still have to live your life. Right. I mean, if your phone system goes down in yeah. a Mercury retrograde, which you is not surprising <laughs> that it would go down in a Mercury retrograde, it's not like you can wait three weeks to replace it. Right. So you have to do the things that you have to do. And uh, as Ralph was saying, the most appropriate thing is to kind of tie up the loose ends of something that you began beforehand yes. or that was already in process as Mercury went retrograde. Okay. Uh, and then you're not going to be so thwarted with things popping up. And there's been some very, very successful companies started with Mercury retrograde. So don't assume that an aspect that might seem on, on, on the surface to be negative is always negative. And, you know, Mercury retrograde means that the, the person or the organization tends to have a good inner conversation. Well, that's important. Well, and there's always a positive and negative manifestation of everything. And why does Mercury appear to be retrograde? It's a chance for you to look inside, mm. slow down a little bit rehash what you've been saying in your head, maybe speak it out loud to make sure that the spoken word matches the internal dialogue you've been mm. having, you know, and, and use it as a, as, a, as a review. Yes, exactly. Now, the Venus, the other point, that Venus going into Virgo will stay in Virgo all the way up to um, August 6th. Give you a little forecast right ahead of that. And on August 6th, um, it enters Libra, its ruling sign. So after being very good and very restrained, August 6th, when it goes into the romantic sign of Libra, things will tend to change. But you're going to have to watch the next forecast to find out how it's going to change. Hi, we're Ralph and Lonnie D'Amicus with another Astrological Minute, or 10. And today we thought we would talk about the big three. You know, what is your sun, moon, and rising sign, and what has it done for you lately? <laughs> I mean, these are the most personal parts of your chart, and they're, frankly, what people first learn about. I mean, just beyond sun sign astrology, 
you get to the sun moon rising yeah. triumvirate and and that gives you a lot of in-depth uh look at you and your personality and your identity. And realize that this is part of the basic trilogy that we see throughout nature, that tendency for things to happen in threes, after all. You know, the good things happen in threes, bad things happen in threes. Well, sun, moon, rising, you know, and it's basically the sun is your spirit, the, the rising is your physical body, and uh, the moon is your emotions. So in that vein, you know, the mm -hmm. sun can give you insights into your sense of self and character, your mm. ego, your identity. Uh, but as you view yourself mm. and as you, uh, you know, deal with the world from your personal perspective, uh, whereas the rising sign really can give you insights into your physical appearance or your physical location or how you relate to your physical um, neighborhood, your, your, you know, your area where you are. And the moon, of course, is your emotional nature. We see the effects of the moon on the planet with the tides and things like that. And we have fluid in the body that goes on a cycle. And it's easy to relate that to your emotions. In some ways, an easy way to think of it is that the sun traditionally relates in some ways to the father. Well, this is very traditional in society, but it was the idea that whatever kind of work your father did was the kind of work that you were going to do. If you came from a family of carpenters, good chance you were going to be a carpenter. If you came up from a family of fishermen, you were going to be a fisherman. That solar, central sense Identity. of self. Right. You know, how many people's last names, like Smith or um, Fisher or Cooper. Uh, Cooper, are names that relate to that family's tradition of working in a particular area. That doesn't really necessarily tell you who the person is. But it does tell you their position in the cosmos, you might say. And I think that's an easy way to think of it. Where the moon, think of how close the word moon is to mother. And so many words that have that connection, emotions. And we learn a lot about our emotional nature and how we relate to the world emotionally from our mother and from the women in our lives, because the men are out there in the world and the mothers are the ones who give birth to us and then take care of us and raise us up to a certain point until we're ready to start a career and then we're handed off to the father. Now maybe to be a little bit more politically correct in this day and age we should say that the sun is an indicator in a chart of the person who taught you how to be out in the world mm, right. <laughs> and the moon is an indicator of the person who taught you to love and feel loved and, and deal with uh, your inner world. So and to be at home even. You know, where the moon oftentimes relates to how we live within our home. And sometimes the genders of that are not exactly oh, not aligned all. with the old uh, preconceived ideas of masculine and feminine. And so this is a different way to look at that. And then, of course, we get to the rising, yes. which is kind of your personality. I mean, we do a three-number numerological system that has a character number, a motivation number, and a personality number. And it really relates to the sun, moon, and rising in your chart, the energy, not the exact sun sign or moon sign or rising sign in your chart, but the energy of this numerological pattern relates to the same kind of emotional feeling that these planets would indicate. It's funny because where, you know, when you say the sun sign, there's one word of saying it. The moon sign, there's one way of saying it. But when you get to the rising sign, you can say the rising sign, or you can say the ascendant, or the ascending sign, or the ascending degree, because it's a mathematical point. It's basically that point on the eastern horizon in the chart, or when you read a chart, it's the line all the way to the left, which would show the eastern horizon. In some ways, you know, it relates to very early morning, it's when the sun pops up over the horizon in your personal life or when your eyes open up and you go, oh, here I am. That's the ascendant. How do you see the world? How are you seen in the world? And it has a lot to do with physical appearance. That's a very important point because no matter where your sun <laughs> falls within the houses of your chart, <laughs> the ascendant is the ascendant and marks the first house. So, yeah. And in terms of physicality, uh, like, and it's so important because this idea of, you know, you only make a first impression first. 
you know, once. Well, it's very true. And the planets that you find by the rising, you know, it's, it's, it's Mars rising, it's Venus rising, it's, it's Uranus rising. The planets near that rising have a lot to do with how you're seen in the world. For instance, people with the sun rising tend to you know, bring a lot of energy to their first experience. It's a great sign for salesmen, though maybe not quite as good as Mars rising because sales takes a lot of bravery. So Mars rising means you bring a lot of physical energy to that first meeting, you know. Now, maybe they're not as good at continuing things into the future, but they're great for that first handshake and for that first discussion because so much energy is concentrated there. And it's interesting, when you look at the charts of very famous um, salespeople, so many of them are born right by the rising, you know, very close to the ascending sign. Their sun is there, or they have a cluster of planets right there because they bring a lot of energy to that initial experience. Well, and you know, uh, your sun in the first house mm. is kind of what you see is what you get. Yes. You know, there's a lot of times, you know, when you meet someone physically <clears throat> in the world, you're actually first meeting their first house, their, yes. their rising sign, their personality, what they want to show to the world the way that they see the world and the way they are seen by the world. But then when you add the sun to that component, that's their identity and their calling and their, mm. you know, their character. So you really get a feeling like you know that person very quickly when they have the sun there. Uh, and if their moon is in the first house, close to the rising sign, you get a feeling of a very emotional person, like an intuitive person or a very uh, person who can really understand your feelings very easily because their moon is the first thing that you meet. And so you get to feel like you know them on an emotional level much sooner than someone who might have the moon in the 10th house or the 8th house. Now the sun moves a degree per day, very steady. The moon actually go, changes a, a degree about every two and a half hours. So it goes to maybe 12 degrees in a day or sometimes less. The moon actually varies its speed a little bit. What does this sound like? Chessboards. The sun is the king. The king moves one stop at a time. But the queen, the moon, can go all the way across the board and change here and do all kinds of things. And it has a lot to do with that difference between that solar self, you know, we are who we are, who we are, and our emotional self, which changes direction a lot, and you never know where it's going to be, and it's going to be flexible and adjust, and it's like how people see us in the world. You know, if a person's in a profession, that's their son, but how, you know, what's their family like? You know, you come in and you, you, you walk into their office, and there's the sign on the door saying what they do, but then you come in, and there behind their desk is a picture of all their family, and their kids, and their cousins, and their there's this whole complex mix of things. And this is really the big difference. You know, it's the sun, moon, spirit, soul in many ways. And I think we should talk just for a minute about the rising because the rising degree changes one degree of the sign every four minutes. Yes. So it used to be that people would come, and they would arrange a consultation with us and we would calculate the charts in advance. They'd take three hours or so to calculate by hand. You know, some of the more complicated charts that we use nowadays would take up to 10 hours to calculate Computers by hand. Computers are so cool. And so the person would finally come, you know, at the time they're supposed to come for a consultation. They say, oh, you know, silly me, I found out that I wasn't born at 8 a.m. I was born at 8 p.m. Does it make a difference? We go, Ooh, yeah. yeah, go away. Come back in a week. I mean, right. we, gotta, we, have, we have to recalculate all of the charts that yeah. we calculated because every four minutes, there's a different degree on the rising or on the ascendant. So you can imagine for 12 mm. hours, you know, you're totally not, you know, no. Taurus rising anymore. I mean, that's, you know, just a given. So that, That's a different person. <laughs> So anything that we had prepared or had in our mind, thank goodness we have computers now. We yes. can calculate that in a minute. And in fact, you know, if you don't know your sun, moon rising, there are many chart services that can calculate that for you. And, mm. and at least you can figure out the symbols, the glyphs for the sun, moon, and rising. And you can figure out those three dynamics of your chart, mm. even if you don't mm. have the opportunity to delve into your chart a little bit more more deeply. Yeah, and in fact, you actually know that when 
like for instance in the planetary calendar, that when the moon is going through the sign of either your moon or your rising, it will tend to be a more emotional day for you. In a good way, hopefully in a good way. And that's if you know that you kind of couch your life in that way and make sure you're going to be around people who you like. And I'm glad you brought up using the calendar because when you're using the calendar, of course, above the number are the glyphs, the symbols that denote uh, the planets. Yep. And mm -hmm. it's one thing to use those glyphs uh, to find the ruler of your sun sign, but you can also use them for the ruler of your rising or your moon yep. to determine what days or actions might be appropriate for you. In some ways, the, the planets that are above the the number are basically which kids are getting along with mom that day. Because it's how they relate yeah. to the moon, yeah. where the sign, where the moon and is. And because the moon changes sign, you know, moves so fast, that changes just like in a family, you know, who's your favorite kid today? You know, I love all my kids the same, but today. <laughs> well, and it favorite. changes signs completely in yeah. every two and a half days. Exactly. So exactly. that's a fast moving energetic flow. Now there's one other point. Most people know that, you know, the sun, moon rising, they know about that, but it's actually another point which is very important, which is in the ancient times and all the way through medieval astrology as well, was considered very important, was the midheaven. And the midheaven is basically another mathematical point like the, the ascendant, and it, but it's directly over your head. And the way I like to describe it is like the, the flag above your castle, because it says, what is my career path going to be? You know, you could have be born to be a fisherman, but maybe your, fish, your father had one boat and you have... Saturn at the midheaven and Leo, and you want to have 20 boats, you know, because it's at the midheaven. It has to do with how are you going to fulfill your responsibilities in the world? How are you going to climb the, climb the cliffs of, of career? And traditionally, this was always considered one of the four most important points along with the sun, moon, rising. And in some ways, I think, um, and depending upon the person, it can be more important if a person's really, you know, that our life is really focused on career or, or on duty. Well, and it doesn't mean that whatever the rising sign is going to determine what your midpoint, midheaven or your career in the end is going to be. It's interesting sometimes to look at and see how one is what you were born into, kind of out of no choice of your own, except for that you know, cosmic choice that you make to incarnate yes. at that time. Uh, and the other one is more what you develop your skills in. And so they can be very different. So it can give us a lot of interesting insights into kind of what your parents might want you to be mm. and what you want to do in the world for your personal satisfaction and success. And life has duality in it. That's just part of the game. So. Exactly. So come visit us again. And uh, you can always see us at spaceandtime.com. And that's another Astrological Minute. We made it in just a minute, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs>